Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is David Ainsworth. I'm head of communications for the United Nations Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, and it's a delight to see so many people physically here uh, in the press conference room on the, the lendemain, the day after uh, the closing of COP15, the United Nations Biodiversity Conference. This will be the last press conference. Um, today, we are very pleased to have with us, uh, first of all, His Excellency Huang Rongchu, the uh, COP15 presidency. We are also delighted to have the minister representing the host country, Mr. His Excellency, Mr. Stephen Gilbo of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, we have Inger Anderson with us, the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, and uh, uh, regrettably, Elizabeth Maruma and Rema is not able to, uh, to, to be with us. But our illustrious trio here uh, are going to be able to speak to you about the events and things, how things happened over last night and moving forward. Uh, the format will resemble the other conferences. We'll have remarks from each of the panelists, uh, and then we will take a number of questions. Um, there will have questions online, uh, as well as some questions uh, in the room. So what I would like to begin with, I would like to invite His Excellency, uh, the COP15 President, Huang Rongchu, uh, to speak. And we have interpretation. President. Uh, uh, Media friends, greetings to you all. The conference of COP15 has concluded. But still, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to our final press uh, or press briefing here. I am very grateful to all of you because during the conference period, you have extended your support to us. I think Montreal is a city of art. It is also a place where we can realize our dreams. Let me briefly share with you my feelings after arrival. The first few days after I arrived, well, the weather was not good. It was cloudy. Every day I saw thick layers of clouds in Montreal. And so my heart was also very heavy. I felt a lot of pressure. I was wondering what kind of progress or what kind of um, achievements could we make from the negotiations. And I really need to thank um, Mr. Gilbert. Actually, there was a big snow, and there is a Chinese saying that snow will bring good luck. So with such a heavy snow, our future will be very bright, and it is going to be full of hopes. And during the small hours of the 19th, when the framework was endorsed or adopted, we celebrated and we all applauded and cheered. At that time, it was already 4 a.m., when we were back to our hotel rooms, at that time, there was actually bright sunlight. So that represented our hopes. And it actually celebrated our final victory. So in the whole process, at the very beginning, I felt a lot of pressure. And then I saw hope. I saw snow bringing fortune and luck to us. And finally, the framework was adopted and the sun came out. We felt uh, hearty and warm. So that's the process. Actually, in the conference just concluded, as you know, we achieved historical success concerning um, the um, our theme of civilized uh, ecological civilization, building a shared uh, future for all life on Earth. Actually, uh, President Xi Jinping made video message, and there are 40 parties and stakeholders announcing a series of major actions and commitments. We also adopted 62 uh, decisions related to the conference. More importantly, we reached a historical, iconic um, outcome document, and that is the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Ladies and gentlemen, under these circumstances, well, many places adhere to multilateralism. At the same time, we know that there is um, clear aspiration of different places from different stakeholders. Now we have reached an ambitious, balanced, pragmatic, effective, robust, and transformative package of solutions. I believe that this framework document can guide us all in our efforts to halt and reverse biodiversity loss and put biodiversity on the path to recovery for the benefits of all humanity. 
especially our children and grandchildren. We have come a long way to reach the framework. We started four years ago at COP14 in Shamo Sheikh. We moved on to Kunming, and finally, we arrived at Montreal. Over the years, we have negotiated, there was disagreement, and we have shown flexibility. We have touched red lines, and finally, we compromised quite a lot. At different places of the world, we have met many times. And even at the height of the pandemic, we worked hard together to move the process forward. Actually, we are actually moving forward biodiversity governance. We have demonstrated our commitment to achieving the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. We have also demonstrated that our commonalities far outweigh our differences. Now, we have finally adopted the historical framework. This framework contains the historic inclusion of the DSI pathway. This framework is also a historic decision to establish the framework fund. And this framework also describes to us the 2050 vision to live in harmony with nature. This is historical. Through the framework, we can see solidarity and cooperation as we work together to, re, uh, to reverse the loss of biodiversity and embark on a path of recovery. Through the framework, we can see the ambition and actions as we work together to build a community of shared life on Earth. And through this framework, we see hope and a future of living in harmony with nature, leaving a clean and beautiful world for our future generations. I would like to take this opportunity to once again express my gratitude to the host governments of Canada, Quebec and Montreal for helping to make the conference a success and to Minister um, Gubit, uh, I would like to express my gratitude. And to my six coordinator ministers, my friends, two working group chairs, two framework co-chairs, and the bureau members representing various regions, I thank them for their leadership and coordination. I thank the entire secretariat staff under the leadership of Executive Secretary Anderson, as well as the UNEP Executive Director Anderson and his team. I would also like to thank the leadership of Executive Secretary uh, Marema. And then for my own team, I also extend my sincere gratitude because they have been working endlessly, tirelessly, so as to uh, achieve success in our conference. I would also like to thank all parties and stakeholders for showing the greatest ambition, the greatest flexibility, and the greatest spirit of compromise in order to bring us to a common framework that belongs to all of us. And that is also our common victory. Besides, I would like to thank all crew members working for this conference, including interpreters, the policemen outside, and various staff, service staff members, friends of the media. It is because your effort and your support that we're able to conclude our conference successfully. Do not say that Luchan Pass is as hard and as iron and is so difficult to overcome. Actually, we should revive ourselves and move forward. Achieving the framework is the successful conclusion of the conference and an exciting new beginning for global biodiversity governance. As president, I hope that all the goals and commitments reached at this conference will stand the test of time and be fully implemented by the time in 2030, when we do global assessment, I hope that our ecological and natural environments will be healthier, stabler, and a lot better. And I hope the trend of biodiversity loss will then be reversed in the next two years, together with my bureau members and the convention secretary secretariat, we will continue to carry out my duties as president 
and work with the parties and stakeholders to ensure the effective implementation of the framework. Once again, thank you very much. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Your Excellency. Um, we are very fortunate that we have with us Mr. David Cooper, who's the Deputy Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Given how much work he was doing last night, I'm impressed that he's able to come. You can set yourself right beside Inger. So, so uh, with that, we have a, a larger panel with us. I'm now going to turn to the Minister representing the host uh, of our meeting, uh, Canada. So His Excellency, Stephen Gilbo. Mr. Gilbo, you have the floor. Thank you very much, David. Rio, Kyoto, Paris, Montréal. Certaines villes sont le lieu de grands événements. Some cities or cities with landmark cities which are related to environment. Montréal, my city has already its own space in such a title. In 1997, Montréal in countries got together to negotiate the Mont Montréal Protocol to agree to eliminate uh, uh, harmful uh, um, chemicals for the ozone layer. This was a way to spare the, the life of millions of, kind of people who could uh, lose their life because of that. For the current generations, we are in a point of no return when it comes to nature. We need to create a new pathway to keep away from uh, constantly destroying the habitat and the species, the health of the forest, of the oceans, of our animals and all biodiversity is the basis for all strength of our society and stability of our societies. We cannot continue to take this for granted. ...that we've achieved a Montreal moment for nature. The Kunmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework is a major win for our planet and for all of humanity. Consider that only six months ago, we did not know if this conference would even take place. And for Canada, as well as many environmental organizations, we could only dream of achieving the level of ambition reflected in the text of the framework. Even only if a week ago, who would have thought we would have a global commitment to protect 30% of lands and oceans? This 30 by 30 is the framework. Who would have thought that we would achieve an agreement to mobilize substantial financial resources to protect nature and biodiversity? Resources that will support countries who are host and steward to the majority of the world's biodiversity. It is in the framework. And on many other points, the text reflects a high level of ambition. Here, I must extend a deep thanks to both the presidency and the convention on Biological Diversity Secretariat. Working in tandem, you have succeeded in guiding the process to great effect. To my counterpart, Minister Wong of China, thank you. Xie Xie. Thank you, Xie Xie. And thank you for entrusting me to co-facilitate ministerial consultations alongside Minister Fouad of Egypt to find a path on 30 by 30. To the entire team of the Secretariat, including Elizabeth, as well as David and Inger uh, at UNEP, thank you so much. And I think this conference has been also a, a journey for, for the Presidency's country and, and, and my own country as, as host country. I think that together over the last six months, we, we've journeyed together to bring this meeting to uh, a successful outcome. And, and for that, I'm extremely grateful to you and to uh, the entire Chinese delegation. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you. Merci. Thank you very much, Minister. So it's my pleasure now to invite the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, Inger Anderson, to take the floor. Good morning to members of the press. Um, this is, as we just heard from Minister Gilbault, a moment for nature that has been quite some time in the making. But allow me to express my deep gratitude to you, Minister of Ecology and Environment, Huang Rongqiu, for your incredible leadership as president of this country, uh, of this conference. I'm sorry, we're all tired. Um, and to the capacity of your amazing staff that have worked so hard um, and of course, to, through you, to the government and the people of China. This has been a long and complex journey, 
but the steadfast determination of the Chinese presidency has brought us here to what the Secretary General yesterday morning called the beginnings of a peace pact with nature. And to you, Mr. Stephen Gilbeau of Canada, who hosts the Secretariat of the Convention of Biological Diversity, our deep gratitude as well, and through you to the government and the people of Canada, and especially the city of Montreal, we've all fallen a little bit of love with your city, and I'm truly grateful. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the extraordinary leadership of the Executive Secretary of the CBD, Elizabeth Marema, her very able deputy, David Cooper, and their terrific team. This team has traveled the journey with the presidency and the host with unrelenting determination to demonstrate that multilateralism for nature is critical to tackling the challenges that humanity faces. They have my deep, deep gratitude. And I paid tribute also, of course, to the many delegates across governments, civil society, indigenous people, private sector, um, and so and science that came to Montreal to push for a truly transformation, transformational deal for people and planet. And yesterday, yesterday, the, yeah, yesterday morning at 3.30, uh, we did it. We made history in the adoption of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And so this is indeed critical that we now have this framework. This new GBF is fun fundamental because it is providing that package deal. We are acknowledging that protecting the natural world represents the sum of many our efforts by governments, by businesses, and by us, each one of us, as individuals and consumers. The new GBF is remarkable because we know our means of implementation now will be stronger, and it includes more financing on the table, especially for developing countries. The new GBF is different because we know that we need to have to do better in what we've done up until now to ensure a fair and equitable share of benefits that derive from genetic resources. And this new GBF is different because we know that we must account for everyone's footprint. But we also know that the framework is not just about words. It's about the actions that drive the transformations we need in relationship between people and nature. And here, we'll be honest, time is not on our side. We've backed nature into a corner, and it's time to ease the pressure. One million species nearing extinction, 10 football pitches lost a minute, three billion people impacted by land degradation. It's a long list. I could go on with all this. But we also know, and this is a remarkable thing, that nature is very forgiving. If we give it half a chance, it will bounce back. And when we give nature a chance, we give human health a chance. We give peace and prosperity a chance. We give people everywhere a chance. So let's now pause, but for one second, to embrace the history that we've made here in Montreal. And let's not, and let's now get down to the business of delivering this framework for people and for planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Executive Director. And so we now have the pleasure to hear from David Cooper, who is the Deputy Executive Secretary of the Convention of Biological Diversity. David, a few remarks from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, and good morning to everyone. Um, it's, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity on behalf of Elizabeth Marema to make a few additional remarks. Um, I would also like to pay tribute to the leadership of, 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 of uh, Minister Huang Guanchu um, and the entire Chinese team um, that have helped to guide us to this successful conclusion and to do so in, in partnership with other ministers and of course in particular with Stephen Gibble uh, uh, from Canada and I think this, this combination of leaders from the north and the south has been emblematic but also enabling of the process uh, to reach agreement over these days um, following the long negotiations we've had in the four years since um, Sharm or Sheikh when we were set on this path forward. And I think as 
as the other speakers have said, this is a triumph of multilateralism. Um, it's not easy to get 196, or to be precise, 188 who are actually participating in the conference, 188 countries to agree on every word in a document. Um, but that is what was achieved. And I think as others have noted or already in the analysis we've seen um, in the media by civil society, it's a pretty good document. It's, it, it is a document of high ambition. Así que es pues, a lot of focus on 30 by 30 and I think we have a very good target uh, on protected areas um, that also recognizes the, um, the important role that indigenous peoples and local communities play. We know that in fact the parts of our, of our landscapes and seascapes that are in the best shape are those that are managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. This recognition is, is really important. But also that those pro protected areas, those are other areas for conservation, we have to make sure they're not only there, but they're effective and that they're in the right places, protecting the right uh, parts of biodiversity. And all of these elements are reflected in the, in the framework. And then, in fact, we have another 30 by 30 target, the target to mobilize at least $30 billion through uh, international financial flows from developed uh, to developing countries. And I think this, um, in fact, is, again, another symbol of the balance that is in this uh, document. We also have elements in the framework, targets in the framework that address the drivers of biodiversity loss directly, land use change, over-exploitation, invasive alien species, the relationship with, with climate change, and even more significantly, I believe, the underlying drivers, the need to integrate values associated with biodiversity into all policies uh, of government across the, uh, across the board. This framework will only be successful if it's integrated, not just implemented, not only by ministers of environment and, and environment ministries, but all sectors of the economy. We need whole of government approach. In fact, beyond that, we need a whole of society approach. And um, I think, again, one of the most significant elements of this framework is the, the recognition that all elements of society must be engaged in uh, its implementation. Um, the other speakers have also mentioned this agreement that's part of the package on digital sequence information. And I really believe this is uh, a landmark shift. Um, the convention itself and the Nagoya Protocol, they enable the sharing of benefits through bilateral means. Um, so if you need access to genetic resources, you can negotiate with the source country to have an agreement on benefits. Over years, as more and more of this genetic information is digitized and stored in uh, global databases, this can perhaps undermine that, uh, that, that requirement for benefit sharing. So this recognition that we need to have in place a mechanism predominantly at the multilateral level to ensure those benefits share, are shared is really significant. Uh, and I believe that it's important not only for the work under this convention, it will be important for work that's happening elsewhere, including, uh, for, for example, the work in WHO uh, on the pandemic uh, influenza, um, uh, on the pandemic preparedness um, treaty under negotiation. Finally, as uh, others have noted, as, as Inga has just said in particular, and as Francis Ogwell, one of the two co-chairs, which uh, together with Basil Van Aff would like to pay tribute to for leading the work over the uh, last few years, as Fran as uh, Francis said in accepting the award from Elizabeth Marema yesterday, 
this is just a piece of paper. And now the real hard work uh, begins of implementing it. We have elements this time, uh, a good framework of indicators um, that will, uh, as well as a decision um, on regularly reviewing progress that I believe will help us be more successful than we were with the Aichi targets in implementation. And perhaps even more important than that, we have much more attention uh, of, uh, of world leaders. Um, and for that, of course, um, we also thank you, the media, for the role you do in uh, spreading the message, in highlighting the importance of these issues and of the need for, for urgent action. What we are trying to do is not easy. And we hope that this uh, agreement, even though it's only a piece of paper, will just make that a little bit easier. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And thank you to all of the panelists here for their remarks. So we'll open up for questions. There'll be a combination of questions from people in the room, uh, as well as people who are uh, online and online questions. So I'm first going to take a question from a gentleman here in the second row. Um, and thank you, Rowan, for stepping into the breach for managing the microphones today. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, so I'm from the, uh, the Chinese press. I'm going to say in Chinese, so for Mr. Huang, so as you mentioned before, in the part, in the next two years, China is going to be the presidency. So I want to say, in terms of implementation of the framework, what's the role of China and what action China is going to take? Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, so in terms of the framework, uh, basically the framework we have, I would say this morning we finally concluded it, which is basically a huge success, which we never done before. As the president of COP15, I still have two years of this in office in terms of implementation. So in the next two years, I have some thought to share with you. So I would basically, on my journey, based on my duty in terms of being a president, and I will do my best to prolong our COP15 to COP16. So basically, by making sure that all the goal will be achieved and in terms of implementation, but there are two things I want to share with you, which I think are of the most importance. The first one is that under the framework, we will have the, the found. So I hope uh, with the drive from me, and uh, all of us can basically uh, take this fund into practice by 2030 and then into practice. By doing so, we can solve all the problem um, in terms of the shortage of funding for biodiversity. The second one I want to share with you is that in terms of DSI, in terms of the implementation, and uh, during the convention, we have established the DSI uh, implementation and the strategy uh, where uh, we will have the multilateral uh, negotiation. And we also established this that the, the roadmap between COP15 to COP16, where we will have some group to, date, to be dedicated to this job. So in terms of promoting uh, this work, I will work as hard as I can as the president so that in COP16, we will have a really great success to handle it. The next one I want to say is that in terms of the, the framework, uh, with the, the guidance we have, in terms of biodiversity, with all the government and all the sectors, which is quite important for us, so we will basically uh, to do all the resources in terms of mobilization, in terms of reporting and assessment, and the third one is that about uh, education and data sharing, which is something I have to promote. We have to ensure that uh, the indigenous people and the local community, women and young generation, and also girls and the youth and all of other people can be involved in this time 
in this a framework. Last but not least, something is really important for me as the president. Uh, we have to prepare our best for the starting of COP16. And of course, at this point, I will closely be in touch with the next presidency from Turkey and to basically uh, make the best meeting convention of COP16 and to, and to do the best handover as we can. So this is what I want to share with you as the president uh, in terms of my roadmap of the following two years. Thank you line here too uh, and we'll come to other people in the room in a minute uh, so I've got uh, I've got Benjamin Legendre of Agence France Presse who says um, and this question is to uh, the COP15 president uh, it Benjamin says that target 19 talks about quote countries that voluntarily assume obligations of developed country parties uh, to reach this 20 billion target by 2025 is China one of these countries and what offer does it bring to the table minister Uh, as I mentioned before, um, basically, uh, China as the as the presidency, and me as the president, I will definitely uh, I will promote the biodiversity in terms of the progress between COP fifteen and COP sixteen. And I think your question is that it's about also about the financial funding. I would say. China, in terms of the funding, what attitude China has, I would say China is one of the 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 is the largest developing country, which is true. So China will uh, abided by the rules of the framework. We will do our duty for sure. So uh, last year we announced the funding of the biodiversity and so far we are also grouping our group for this so now i will call for all the funding can be involved on the other hand uh, china is also one of the country uh, in terms of the uh, biodiversity funding and also the biggest contributor uh, since 2010, China has been uh, has been one of the biggest contributor um, in terms of the biodiversity funding and other two agreement. So with this framework, we also we've been do dominating a lot of tangible goods and as well as training. And China will definitely make more effort to the developing country as, as best as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take a question in the second row. Thank你的提问。我想你这个问题的话, 好,谢谢你的提问,我想你这个问题的话呢,这两天国际社会已经做出了。Yeah, I think in the past two days, the global community already responded this, to this. They all think that we already uh, concluded the framework. And I think as the president, I think we make this great success already. In terms of ambition, as the gentleman next to me already said that, from the framework, we will say 30, 30. This is already one of the ambition we have achieved. And in terms of resource uh, motivation, I will say we already have the fund, as I mentioned before, which is going to uh, be really helpful for the developing countries. So by 2050, we will contribute at uh, 20 billion a year. And by 2030, we will do at least annually Sorry, uh, sorry. So by 2030, we will do 30 billions by 2030. And of, of course, from other different channels, including uh, financially from the private sector, etc., we will have 200 billions um, 
funding for the biodiversity as well. So it, in terms of strengths, you can see this is quite ambitious and this is really difficult uh, to, to achieve. So the, the third one is the, quite historical and basically including uh, the DSI into the framework. As David already mentioned before, a DSI uh, four years ago, this, this basically four years ago, we thought this problem was can, uh, cannot be solved. But with the past four years, we already solved the problem. We already solved it not. And all the parties already quite already been satisfied, which I think was kind of difficult challenge as well. Uh, in terms of the, yeah, uh, in terms of the, the, the our goal, and in terms of supporting the goal, and in terms of basically, um, in, in terms of shifting our different resources, we have been doing our best to make the balance in terms of the resources are given, and we also have an XBI uh, support. So in terms of their uh, support and scientific base and through our different negotiation, finally, we have found that the goal, the balance and the best combination between the goal and our resources that we can use. So basically, as I said, we can see the subtle a balance between these two. And these two is really, really precise. So maybe one tiny adjustment can change and maybe bring our collapse. collapse. So I think the balance is so far is perfect. So I think, once again, I think frameworks is ambitious and also balanced at the same time. Thank you. Merci, Eric Pierre Champagne de La Presse. Eric Berg uh, from La Presse. I have a question for the uh, co-presidency the Chinese presidency. It seems that there has been a good cooperation between Canada and China during this COP. And do you believe that this success will be a way to facilitate and make the rela diplomatic relationships easier between both countries? You know, there are some issues where they are difficult and there is a bit of tension. Do you think this will be a way to improve relationships between both countries? The voice. I'm sorry. Okay. Ah, already made a brief introduction. I would like to add something. Yeah, of course, of course. Ah, things that six months ago, where we decided. That the COP15 will be held in Montreal, Canada, uh, in terms of the work level, uh, also between the cooperation between myself and the gentleman next to me, we have been closely in touch. I would say once a week we have a meeting, and also we on a regular basis we still have different meeting uh, in terms of our preparation and also the question we might be asked. So in terms of this point, I have been. Sending my hugest gratitude, gratitude through the meeting. So I would say Canada has been really helpful. And also the, the great success already in front of you. So, so far, I would say in terms of the cooperation uh, between Canada and China, there has been a lot of great success between us in terms of our collaboration between two countries since the 90s. And one of the example is that uh, China, the Inter so international Chin Chinese international development uh, cooper uh, cooperation, cooperation, which is one of the highest council uh, in terms of the, the Chinese uh, development, and 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 uh, Canada has already been one of the members since the 90s and one of the biggest contributor among the council in the council. So on the platform, uh, based on the last 30 years of cooperation. So you can see we have been, we have been, we have been really helpful and great to each other in terms of giving each other advice and uh, different uh, cooperation. So in terms of our diversity in China, of course, I think China, uh, Canada has been has been there for us. So in terms of history, you can see there are there has been a great tight uh, between both countries. And 
in terms of the global cooperation, which is basically also set a great example uh, globally. So myself is executive, vice executive, and uh, and you know we have all the like a uh, vice president, a uh, president here from the different groups, and here on the panel we are they are all important uh, members of staff. So that's why we have made a lot of great success in the, in the past few years. So I would say uh, China and Canada, we don't have any, we don't have any disagreement in the past and we don't have any confrontation between these two countries. Um, basically, you can see being good to each other in terms of country, this will bring welfare for both countries and China has been open and has been willing to accelerate our cooperation between the two countries. So I hope that in the future, during the process, China, uh, Canada can be more involved in terms of our cooperation, um, which will once accelerate our great cooperation and relationship between two countries already. Thank you. Well, the question was about uh, the Chinese presidency. We got a question here up front. I guess it's Mike Casey of the Associated Press. Hi, Mike Casey uh, with Associated Press. Um, again, congratulations on the conference. Um, this is for the COP president. Um, after the uh, vote in the intervention from Congo, there were some questions of legality of the framework, and I wanted to see if you would like to comment on that and how that was resolved. I believe this question involves the procedural points of the conference, so I would like to defer to Inger or some person, some representative from the Secretariat to supplement, please. And then possibly to David Cooper to answer. Thanks very much, Inger, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't understand what you said, David, but I understood what the, yeah, I understood your question perfectly. So no, thank you very much for that. Clearly, um, when uh, the gavel went down, um, the framework was then approved. Um, there was no formal objection logged as per UN procedures. Accordingly, therefore, it stood. However, there was a sense among some in the room that they would have liked to have had the chance at 3.30 a.m. in the morning uh, to have a deeper exchange. Um, based on the advice from the Secretariat, this was delayed um, because everyone was exhausted. However, the following day, there was very good uh, exchanges amongst and between a number of delegations. And um, it, it was actually very noticeable that uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the first statement that the president, uh, where he gave the floor to the, to the uh, distinguished minister from the DRC, uh, she made a statement in which she wholly endorsed the framework um, and its validity yet also, of course, uh, was concerned that her desire for additional resources uh, was still not met. I think we all can be um, uh, sympathetic to the desire for more resources. Congo, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, is a very large, very mega diverse country that uh, stands to uh, be a provider of ecosystem services uh, to the world not just uh, to their own people. Um, so uh, the, the concern clearly is from a country as large as that, that resource stream are fully adequate. But from a legality point of view, uh, we are absolutely rock solid in terms of uh, what transpired. Thank you. I think I'd like to invite David Cooper to provide a few of their backup comments. Thank you very much, Inger. Thank you, I, I, I don't really have very much to add, but just to, I think, reinforce also the significance of that moment when Minister Huang went up to um, Her Excellency, the Minister uh, and Deputy Prime Minister of uh, the DRC, um, and then the response. So 
acknowledging that that uh, DRC recognized that this uh, agreement had in fact been adopted um, and although she had some reservations um, working to support its implementation and I think that was um, a key moment in overcoming any of the the um, um, concerns that, m that might have been uh, over the, the, the rapid adoption uh, um, earlier uh, in, the, in the day. Um, and I believe also there was a very clear sense in the room that we have an agreement there that all supported um, um, because of both its ambition and its balance. Great, thank you very much. So I have another question online. Now for the panelists, this question isn't directed to anyone in particular, so at the risk of putting everyone on the spot, here it comes to the whole bunch. The question is from Julie Reimer, who is from German Radio Deutschlandfunk, uh, and she says, the Global Biodiversity Framework, well she should have said the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, is legally not binding. How can an agreement like this develop a binding impact or effect? And she would ask, as an example of another agreement such as this that's not binding, which developed a binding dynamic. So it's le not legally binding, but how can we develop this effect overall? And so I apologize, but I'm going to throw it over and look down the panel and ask someone to step forward. We've got well, both maybe, and then the maybe minister. Maybe I could take it to start. We at UNEP are privileged to host 17 multilateral environmental agreements, and we have some good experience. Um, now it's correct that some of these uh, have legally binding elements in them, CITES, where you have to have an export permit or not, as the case may be, um, if you want to move certain materials across borders. Um, the, the Montreal Protocol, which Minister mentioned in his very opening, where certain substances are supposed to be exited from the industry and economy, However, what we are also seeing in quote-unquote non-legally binding agreements is, of course, that the very light that has been shone on the issue demands a degree of public attention, demands a degree, therefore, often of political leadership, and demands a degree of legislation at home and in trading and in intergovernmental relations um, that enable that these measures that the focus has now been placed on are actually adhered to. And of course, the fact that uh, countries uh, in all of these agreements, which we're privileged to host, have to report in how they are doing and therefore have a spotlight shone on them. Are you living up to the commitments you made or not? And members of the press will be the first to point out domestically or internationally whether indeed this is the case. So yes, while the UN is not in the business of going into countries and enforcing laws, um, this is obviously sovereign business. But nevertheless, I think that what we are seeing is that these things inevitably trickle into domestic legislation, domestic voter and public demand, domestic civil society engagement, and domestic media focus. And that is how we shift that broader needle. In addition, um, as people are also consumers, um, there is often a shift from consumption on a number of, of, uh, of products that can potentially be seen as environmentally harming. Um, that includes, in this case at times, um, certain forms of single-use plastic or certain chemicals, etc., that people no longer want in their lives. So for this framework, I am absolutely persuaded, since it takes a whole-of-society approach, that the whole of society will step in in its various form to deliver its agreement. Reporting back to the Conference of Parties and to the Convention Secretariat will greatly enable the shining of the light on this. Thank you, It looks like Minister Gilbo wanted to also report. Briefly, I would echo what, uh, what Inger just, just said. Um, and I think the next step for, for many of our countries, certainly including mine in Canada, is to develop legislation to enshrine the targets uh, that we've agreed to here uh, in, in Montreal as part of the Kunmin Montreal Biodiversity Framework um, in, in law. Uh, we're, we're doing it. We, have, we already have an accountability act for, for our climate change targets, so it, it makes absolute sense that we should have an accountability act uh, in, in, in Canada for, for our biodiversity targets. And I think you will see a number of countries around the world started, starting to do the same thing. Some of us have already started talking, uh, comparing notes, 
so that that will be a, an important step in the implementation of this meeting and 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 obviously you know the fact that we have to report back as as inger was saying the fact that you the press will will question us and and civil society will will keep our feet to the fire is is another important element uh, two years between uh, between cbd cop is is a long time but but we want to find ways to keep the momentum going uh, that we've built together here in montreal thank you Excellent. Thank you very much. So, uh, regrettably, to those online in the room, we're going to have to bring this to a close. Uh, we're, 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 we're through. I want to thank our distinguished panelists who are no doubt exhausted, uh, but for taking their time with being with us. Um, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank all of you members of the media who've been with us for these two weeks. So, a wonderful success here in Montreal, a Montreal moment, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>